Very interesting to see the drama from last night, but how does that affect the assets that you deal with? What it means is that we tend to have a negative bias or we, we are avoiding French debt at the moment. And I guess along with that, we're also avoid, uh, avoiding Italian debt. We see Italian debt as a geared version, if you like, of, of, of French debt. Albeit, our underlying assumption is that Le Pen will not win. Um, the thing that we're most concerned about is that there will not be a high turnout, certainly maybe in the first round, up to 40% of voters may not turn out. And if there's a low turnout, that does give Le Pen, when it comes to the second round, um, a, a better chance. So what we learned from last year is, is that never say never. But again, our underlying assumption is Le Pen does not win. Yeah, doesn't last night's, um, I, I don't want to call it a loss in, in the debate, but doesn't her performance last night kind of take some of that risk off the table? It does take some of that risk off the table. And you know, one of the things we take comfort from is that more than 70% of voters want to retain the euro, given that one of her mainstay policies is to remove France from the euro and also leave the EU. Uh, we, we don't think that that nationalist policy will be backed by French voters. So ultimately, it will be anyone but Le Pen come the second round. Let's pick up on that point. So I chaired, and I've got a great chart here. So this is, let me just explain, this is English law versus local law. This is the CDS spreads. This relates to the common action clauses. Uh, and you, if you are under English law, you are much more protected against, uh, against this idea that France leaves the single currency. Uh, and you've seen that spread really blow out between these two. I, I chaired a panel last night uh, here at Bloomberg. And one of the things that I was surprised about was how seriously all the panellists, and these were, these, were, these were big guys, and they were, they were talking about, um, and they run a lot of money and they all take the the breakup of the euro very seriously mm -hmm. and they think it's just going to be one of those stories that's going to come back again and again and again if it's if it's the french election or the italian election if those two don't deliver it'll be something else further down the road this is a story that doesn't go away until ultimately the either the euro fixes itself or breaks itself mm -hmm. like, is, the, is that just what we're going to have to live with I think it is. Um, I think if you were to ask the question, will the euro be around in 10 years, I think there'd be a much different response to will the euro be around in, in one year's time. I mean, apart from anything else, unwinding the euro in a very short space of time is a very difficult thing to do, which uh, Ms. Le, um, Madame yep. Le Pen would find out uh, uh, very quickly. So I, I agree with all of those things. And as I said, I think it's not so much the French elections, it's actually the Italian elections. The, Ita the Italian economy's performed very poorly for 20 years. They've got a, they've got a pop populist there who's saying, well, I will pay you a citizen's income of 780 euros a month. So that would be very popular. So, and then there's going to be an election there within the next year. The, the French election is, is the near-term risk. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, but I'm, but I'm looking at Europe and I'm trying to understand the dynamics that's going to drive it further forward from here. People are saying, well, if Le Pen doesn't win this time, her chances of winning next time are greater. The world could look very different next time. Mm -hmm. Mario Draghi won't be here then. Is it, too, is it too early to start thinking about a reassessment of the reaction function at the ECB? So I guess one of the things, if we're looking at the longer term, I mean, our, the assumption we're making is that, we're going, that Europe's going to be facing secular stagnation. Of course, what may happen, we're starting to see that some of the green shoots of recovery is that the European economy now is doing much better. If we can have a normalisation of the world economy, which includes the European economy, it could be that Europe, the European economy looks a very different place in, in four or five years. Now, I'm not saying that the Italian economy is going to be growing at 3% um, continuously, or the French economy, uh, for that matter. But nonetheless, we're coming from a very low base. Where, where do you see the most opportunity to invest, Aaron? Where do you see um, the most underpriced fixed income instruments? I have to say at the moment there is very little that's attractive in the fixed income world, right up from government bonds. I mean, we just heard the story about gilt yields being about 1%, so we're, we've retraced half the movement up in, in gilt yields. Um, in credit, credit spreads are looking uh, n not very attractive by historic standards. And um, if you want to take a punt on things like the French election, you, um, you can do. And maybe if you can lock in a credit spread of 70 or 80 over on, on French government bond yields, that may turn out to be a good short-term trade. But you are taking a punt there. And to say what we learnt last year is, is that expectations don't always come true. How about European credit? 
Like there's a big buyer again, the ECB's a big buyer. Mm -hmm. What does the European credit look like? What does it look like versus the US credit story? Mm -hmm. US credit's more interesting, it's more attractive, so you've got maybe a wider spread and you've also got higher starting yields, so on both of those things it looks more attractive. Although, of course, for those investors that must hedge back, which is many of them, it's not so... you, you take away some of that attraction. What about UK credit? So, I, I just want to dig into this. Mm. If you take UK... if you're a local investor here in the UK yeah. and you're looking at Europe, UK credit, U, UK credit looks really attractive versus US credit, once you hedge it back into the UK, and European credit once you hedge it back into the UK. Why do, why, there must be pockets where credit is interesting, and maybe the UK is one of them. UK, the credit spread on UK, on UK investment grade, for example, has always been higher than other markets, and I think the UK on a relative basis is, is more attractive. Having said that, if you're going to the US and buying your US credit and hedging, hedging it back, given the interest rate differentials, now the US is higher, that's costing you returns to do that, so that makes it less, less attractive going overseas to the US and coming yeah. back.